Thank you so much, and I apologize again for the technical glitch, but I, I do think we need to thank the extraordinary technical team who came through in the last minute for three different ways to try to connect my machine, so please. <laughs> So on September 13th, the Wall Street Journal started publishing a series of articles called the Facebook Files. Articles based upon an extraordinary archive of material that had been taken from Facebook and turned over to the SEC, to Congress, and to the Wall Street Journal. And then three weeks later, 60 Minutes, major television program in the United States revealed that it was a woman named Frances Haugen, former Facebook employee who had taken pictures of files inside of Facebook to turn them over to the SEC and to the public. And two days later, she then testified to the United States Congress about a consistent pattern she observed inside of Facebook. And the pattern was whenever Facebook was faced with a choice between making their platform safer and making their platform more profitable, they chose profit over safety. And then just this week, October 25th, the same files were made available to newspapers around the world and hundreds of articles are now spreading the information about what the Facebook files evince. Now, I'm one of Frances Haugen's legal team. I represent her in legal strategy and communications. And I don't want to talk about the specifics of what she did. But what I do want to ask here is, what does this teach us? What does it teach us about democracy, or maybe we should say digital age democracy? What can we learn from what these files reveal? Because my fear is that what we learn, indeed my view of what we learn, is that it is not good for the future of democracy right now. Indeed, I fear we are on a tipping point where the opportunity to protect democracy against the consequences of these platforms is severe if we don't act fast. Okay, so obviously there are many digital platforms across the world. There are just a few that are dominant and many others as well. But all of these platforms are presented to us as if they are platforms of free speech, as if they are platforms of creativity. And indeed they are. But what this is said to mean, what it's said to entail, at least for some, is that the fact that they are platforms of free speech means they are unregulable platforms, constitutionally unregulable platforms, because of the protections for free speech guaranteed in most liberal constitutions. I want to argue to you that this does not follow. But to see why, it's going to take some work. So that's the work I want to do in the couple minutes I can have your attention here. So these platforms, this is how they see it. This is how the companies see these platforms. They describe them as these wonderful spaces of free speech, where individuals are invited to contribute their ideas and the ideas are made available to everyone around the world. And the idea of interfering or regulating these platforms is framed as if it's about canceling certain messages. And that reaction is described as, quote, censorship. But that's not quite what is at stake. Because the concern about these platforms actually is that these platforms are selectively amplifying content on their platforms. They're selectively choosing some messages to spread broadly and other messages to hold back. 
And since they are driven by the desire for profit, it just turns out that the messages they are amplifying bring out the worst in all of us. The worst in all of us because those are the messages that are most addictive and viral. And so their choice is a choice about elevating the worst because elevating the worst is the most profitable to them. But then the platforms say, okay, fine, this selective amplification is just like editorial choice. It's just like when the New York Times decides which articles go where on the front page of their newspaper, elevating certain articles for the purpose of making the product more compelling. But once again, I'd say that's not quite true. These choices made by these platforms are choices not made by humans, but by machines. What I call mysteriously at the beginning and which I will return to at the end, replicants. And my claim is that difference should matter Constitutionally, it should matter, even if it does not yet matter, at least in the context of the United States. Okay, so here's the way to see it should matter. These platforms, of course, are businesses. These businesses have business models. These business models depend upon us increasing the attention that we give to them. Their objective is to grab our attention and hold it for as many hours in the day as they can. And this increased attention means that they need increased intelligence about us so that they can figure out what best will grab our attention. And this increased intelligence means that they are better able to target what they know you or you or any of us individually might want, and better targeting means increasing their revenue, which of course means more profit to them. So to increase our attention, these platforms exploit, and I want to emphasize that word, exploit our weaknesses, our human weaknesses. These platforms come to understand us and manipulate us, to get us hooked or addicted or dependent so that we stay or come back for more. Now, of course, it's not just them, and this is not the first time a business has tried to figure out how to hack us in order to grab us or keep us or make us their customers. Think about our bodies, human bodies, get hacked. By hacked, I mean taken over by systems or intelligence with alien purpose, alien purpose to you. Let's call this body hacking. This is what I mean. Think about food. I first came to Hungary in 1982, but then in the early 1990s, I was here teaching in the summers. And I was so embarrassed that the first instances of American culture in this city were Dunkin' Donut shops everywhere. And then Kentucky Fried Chicken everywhere. And what were these processed food companies about? They were making food, but not food like this. Instead, food like this. Indeed, this, the buffalo wings, the perfect mix of salt, sugar, and fat, the perfect mix designed to addict you to the product. Indeed, the buffalo wing is a kind of miracle, but a miracle in the sense that Tide is a miracle. It's a choice, a design choice by food scientists food architects working in laboratories, figuring out the best mix of salt, fat, and sugar to addict you. This book by Michael Moss tells the story of food science, the emergence of a science to engineer food, to overcome 
a natural resistance that we would have so that you can't stop consuming this food. This is what I mean by body hacking. Exploiting evolution with the aim, what is the aim? Obviously the aim is to make money. And for some, this of course is harmless. Plenty of healthy people eat bad food. But for others it is not harmless. It is harmful. And they know, the companies know, that we can't resist what they sell. But the critical point to recognize is that they can't resist it either. Because the second half of this extraordinary book tells the story of how these processed food companies come to recognize that their food is poisonous, that it's actually harmful to the people who are consuming it, and then executives within those companies decide that they will try to make healthier food with their companies. And those healthier food, that healthier food is sent out to the market, and of course the people don't like it as much, so their sales goes down, which leads to the market valuation of the company going down, and then the executives who had these ideals of making their food more healthy are fired from the companies, and the companies go back to their old ways, claiming the market made us do it. And indeed, the competitive market drives them to deliver to us what we desire most, and once they have designed their food to be as it is to us addictive, they can't afford to do anything else. That's what I mean by body hacking. Okay, now, the focus of the internet is not body hacking, it is brain hacking. Tristan Harris, a former Google engineer, started the Center for Humane Technology, and his work describes the science in Silicon Valley, the science of Silicon Valley, which is a science designed to engineer attention, to get us to overcome our natural resistance to these digital devices. This is not a resistance of bodies, it's a resistance of brains, and the means is exactly the same. What these companies are doing is exploiting evolution to grab our attention. The fact that we have evolved to be especially sensitive to, sensitive to random rewards, or that we have evolved to be extremely resistant to stopping the consumption of endless feeds of content, the bottomless well addictions. They learn this about our psychology, and they adapt their technologies to overcome this resistance, addicting us, with the aim, obviously, to make money. Now, mainly they make money from ads, not just from ads, but mainly from ads. And as a footnote, it's useful to remember that when the internet was born, ads were nowhere on the horizon. Indeed, the Google engineers, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, when they launched Google, declared advertising-funded search engines will be inherently biased towards the advertisers and away from the needs of consumers. But then they quickly realized that unfunded search engines would be biased against the Google investors, so they quickly had a genius, as in evil genius, idea to launch what Susana Shoshana Zuboff has called the era of surveillance capitalism. And what surveillance capitalism says is let's develop techniques to spy on our customers or on our users. And not spy in a traditional sense, not just passively watching, but we will collect what's called the digital exhaust of their experiences on the internet, or we could say the mouse droppings of their experience on the internet, and use that to better understand what these users want. But not just by watching them, not just by passively sitting back and counting how many people go to different sites, but by actively poking and tweaking and asking them questions and rendering us vulnerable, reaching down the brain stack to our emotional insecurity so that we reveal more 
to the platforms. This is the model of Instagram and Facebook, to drive us to make more of these dro droppings so that they can see more, so that they can sell more and sell better. Now the point is, here too, they are exploiting features of us, us humans, to give them a certain power to induce us, to give them what they need. And what they need, of course, has made Silicon Valley extremely rich. And what they need now makes the internet as we see the internet existing. Which leads some, like Mark Zuckerberg, to say it's just a win-win. We get a free internet, they get all the data they can about us, and that leads them to have a business which, as a Facebook executive recently put it, prints money in the basement. So would that it were a win-win, because the reality is it's not. Because there are unintended, and let's just hope they are unintended, it would be really ev evil if they were intended, but unintended side effects of surveillance. Unintended side effects for individuals, as we look at individuals increasingly addicted to these technologies and some driven to extremes, such as the extraordinary rise in teen suicide, especially among young girls, in the period perfectly correlated with the rise of these technologies. But the part I'm focused on today is the externality, the harms to society, which I'm sure you've seen these images as frequently as we have, the events of January 6th, when an extraordinary mob of people riled up to believe that the election had been stolen, marched on the capital of the United States with the intent to force the vice president to throw the election for Donald Trump. Now, of course, Facebook didn't make this happen. The internet didn't make this happen. But, but for Facebook and the internet, this would not have happened. This craziness that manifested itself is the natural outcome of the technologies that have been deployed by these platforms. Because as this machine, and we need to recognize it's a machine, it's not Mark Zuckerberg deciding which messages will get surfaced. It is a technology, an AI-driven technology. We should think of it as a manipulation engine. We could abbreviate that, me. We could call these monster me's. As these monster me's selectively amplify and suppress information, its choice has an effect, especially an effect on democracy. Because here's the sad fact about us and democracy. The best strategy, as in the most profitable strategy, the most profitable surveillance capitalism strategy in the citizen domain, the democracy domain, is to exploit the politics of hate. The most profitable strategy is to render us polarized and ignorant. Because that renders us angry and emotional and sensitive to false information, which turns out to be better for them than pleasant or factual or true information. So we have a business model driven, a business model committed to making us stupid. And it's not just on the internet. Cable television in the United States took off in the 1980s, but it only began to become the system it is today at the beginning of the 2000s. So this graph I'm going to show you is a measure of the ideological content of the three major cable networks, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News with your favorite anchor, Tucker Carlson. So, in the 2000s, yes, that was a joke, I'm sorry, thanks for the one person who <laughs> laughed at that joke. At the beginning of the 2000s, there was no difference in the ideological content between these three networks. But beginning in 2000, these networks began to veer in a fundamental way. 
so that each network now focuses on a base. And its objective is to tell the story its base wants to hear. And as we all have a psychological desire to confirm our own biases, these networks feed us what we desire. It confirms in our heads what we want to believe. And so the reason today that more than half of self-identified Republicans in the United States believe that there is clear evidence that Donald Trump had the election stolen from him, the reason they believe that is that they live in a bubble that tells them that and that's what they want to believe. This is a product of a business model for cable. It is the same on the internet. These are business models that profit from, in this sense, harming us. And here's then the link I wanted to make between body and brain hacking. Because both are really just business models, just ways for corporations to make money. And yet both have profound consequences for our societies. What pays them weakens us, weakens our health, physical, social, and political. Less profitable for them is anything different from that structured bias. So is there any surprise that we are in this sense unhealthy and in this sense unhealthy? Okay, so can anything be done about this? The free speech extremists in the American context would say no, there's nothing that can be done. That the selective amplification and suppression of speech is speech. And speech, because of the First Amendment or our constitutional protections, can't be regulated. The choice to elevate can't be regulated. But as I've suggested, there's a mistake here, and here is the mistake. When these editors make a choice about which speech gets elevated, that is a choice made by humans. And it is humans that have rights. Facebook is not a human. Monster me's are not humans. And monster me's, these manipulation engines, should not be deemed to have rights. Indeed, I'd say, if we can't draw a distinction between the constitutional protections that you and I are entitled to because we are humans, and constitutional protections being accorded to these machines, if we can't make that distinction now, we are lost. If we can't regulate them, then they will regulate us. For the purposes they identify as theirs, regardless of the harm to us, to society, and to democracy. If we can't regulate them, we are, then we are like this famous film, stuck on the train with no way off. And unfortunately, that's the rule in the United States now. But I want to suggest we think of the United States as the canary in the coal mine. That idea is, suggests, I'm sure, is familiar everywhere. Miners used to carry birds into coal mines, and the birds were singing, everything was safe. But when the birds were killed, that meant there was gas in the coal mine, and you had to get out quickly. I suggest we should recognize the United States as democracy's canary. And when we see what's happening in the United States, we should recognize it is not so exceptional in this sense. Okay, one more idea. What regulations then specifically make sense to deal with this problem? Well, first I want to identify two principles that should govern the selection of any regulations that might address this problem. The first principle is to recognize that we can't allow the Constitution to be determined by technology. And what I mean by that is this. This is the First Amendment to the United States, edited a bit. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Imagine there had been an amendment written in 1791 that said, 
Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of locomotion. Okay, now in 1791, what locomotion meant was running and walking and horseback riding. So this would be the Constitution saying, you can make no law restricting that freedom. And in 1791, that meant don't regulate those. Okay, but obviously, the technology of locomotion changes, or technology, locomotion is a function of technology. And beyond walking and running in horses, we've seen trains, cars, planes, and helicopters. So can we regulate those? Would a speed limit violate a right to locomotion? Well, there are two views in our tradition. One view says the baseline for the right of the government to regulate is not determined by the technology. We don't look to the technology and then ask what can the government do, we ask what can the government do given technologies. And the second approach says technology determines the baseline. So whatever technology enables, we then say can the government do something relative to that technology? And so with the locomotion example, that would mean technology has given us helicopters. There would be no right of the government to regulate helicopters because freedom to use helicopters would be embodied by the freedom of locomotion so described. The First Amendment in the United States is being interpreted as if the technology determines the right. But this is not necessarily the approach that the government has taken in other contexts, that the court has taken in other contexts, and I don't think it should take it here. That's principle one. Principle two is that there are meta values or principles that should always matter regardless of whether the particular target of regulation is protected speech. So even if the speech is not protected, or even if the activity which happens to speak is not protected. This approach says the government is still limited in what the government can do because of these meta values. So for example, when the Supreme Court concluded that hate speech was not protected speech, it still insisted that the government couldn't select among hate speech and ban some while not banning others. Even though the speech was not protected speech, the government couldn't be selective in its regulation because neutrality was a meta value which the government had to abide by. Okay, those two principles, meta values and technology, then I think lead to, to these policies. Number one, what Daphne Keller from Stanford called circuit breakers, or I just wanna call speed limits. Speed limits in the context of digital platforms should be imposed. Now, what does that mean? The data from the Facebook files um, give this snapshot of Facebook. In February to March of this year, there were three billion people across the world who touched Facebook. Of those three billion, one billion people posted a post that was shared by someone else. So one billion did at least one reshare. Of that one billion, 40 million produced content that was shared by at least half of the people using the platform. And of those 40 million, 20 million people produced content that was shared and comprised 50% of the views on Facebook, which means 0.7% of the Facebook users produce content that accounts for 50% of the views on Facebook. Now, if you're in media, if you run a television company or if you run um, a radio company or a, uh, a record um, label, this is an astonishing fact. It means 0.7% of your users give you for free the content that half of your audience 
wants to consume. We would call these sharecroppers. These are people who work but get nothing for their work, and their work becomes the core of the profit of what Facebook produces. But more importantly, these producers of content that gets reshared are purveyors of misinformation because Facebook's own files, Facebook's own data, demonstrates 38% of misinformation on the Facebook platform is accounted for by content that happens to have been reshared twice. So it's reshared twice. It is four times more likely to be false than any other content. And depending upon the number or the depth of these reshares, that can increase from five to 10 times more likely to be false. Well, in response to that reality, the reality that as people share content, the content that gets virally quickly reshared is most likely to be false, a speed limit would just impose slow down requirements to this content. Speed limit would limit the number of reshares, simple reshares of content. So the Center for Humane Technology is advancing a one-click safer program which says we should make it so that you can limit, you can reshare content twice. And once it's been reshared twice, you have to copy the URL and put it into your own email or copy the URL and put it into your own messenger and then share it like that. And that simple friction, Facebook executives assert, would do more good than all of the fact-checking that Facebook now deploys. So this is not content that's blocked, it's content that's slowed. We could say it's slowed to human speed to at least give us a chance as humans to catch up and to process it in a healthy, reflective way rather than in the way we can be manipulated with this content spread as it is right now. That's number one slow the content down. Number two, increase responsibility for the platforms. In the United States, Section 230 is the section of the law that basically immunizes platforms from any responsibility for defamation or harmful content on their platform. Some have suggested, and I think correctly, that this immunity needs to be revised so that as Facebook identifies super viral or poisonously viral content, content that's being shared quickly and, and viciously, they should tag it so they can identify it. And then when or if it is demonstrated to be false or defamatory um, or inciting of violence, it can be easily removed, taken down. So this is not in advance, but quickly and easily afterwards so that they become responsible for the ultimate harm, at least where they have easy ability to identify this potential harm. And number three, we may need to flip the presumptions for these algorithms. So these MIT and Harvard um, uh, computer scientists have proposed treating algorithms, as they put it, like prescription drugs. And what they mean by that is if you go to the 19th century in the United States, drugs were unregulated, but if they were harmful, then the government could prosecute the drug maker for producing a harmful drug. But the problem is their harm has long been done and it takes many years to prove that the drug is harmful, so many people have been injured before any good can be done. The 20th century reversed that. Rather than block it if the harm is proven, in the 20th century, we flipped the regulatory regime and said that you had to prove the drugs were not harmful before you could deploy them in the market. And the same could be done with algorithms, at least in certain contexts. So for example, if the algorithm is targeting kids, if it's an algorithm designed to bring young people onto a platform or to use the platform, then a company should be forbidden from deploying that platform until they can demonstrate up front that it doesn't produce harmful consequences for kids, such as the Instagram platform, which induces young girls who have body dysphoria uh, issues to consume more and more of those images until many are driven to self-suicide. 
Okay, those are three changes. And notice none of those changes look to the content and evaluate whether it's good content or bad content. All of these changes are tweaks to the code to create a safer technical environment than the one we see right now. Okay, one final thought, maybe this is the TLDR. Um, let's go back to the first slide, regulate replicants. So replicants have, for science fiction buffs, a very particular origin, and unfortunately because though the technology team was brilliant, we weren't able to compensate for the sound in the presentation. But if we could see the sound in this presentation, what you would see here is the scene from Blade Runner where this replicant, who is the you know, muscular guy in shorts here, um, uh, begins to recite for the guy whose job it is to hunt down and kill replicants poetry. And the astonishing recognition that he has, that these creatures he's trying to destroy have evolved extraordinarily human characteristics, even the characteristic of composing their own poetry. This is a replicant. And the category I want to describe by describing replicants is an intelligence that we create, but we can't control. If any of you have teenagers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> we created the teenager, but we can't control them. And when we have ca category like this clear in our head, we can recognize how hopeful and wonderful the thing is that we've created but against the background of constitutional principles, we should recognize that that thing that we created but that we don't control is not itself entitled to rights. Maybe we should give replicants the right to recite poetry, maybe. I'd be for it. But my point is they don't automatically have rights when those rights were crafted for us. And these creatures, especially these AI technologies that will increasingly wrap themselves around every aspect of our life, we must resolve, can be regulated because we understand how they are driven in their quest to maximize profit to themselves, to behave in ways that can easily harm us. And if we can't protect against that, then we have given over this society, our society, to the ends which they are seeking. All right, thank you very much and thank you for your patience in coming to this presentation. Thank you very much for your truly inspiring presentation. Now, I would like to give the floor to our audience who are, I'm sure, very eager to uh, pose their questions. Yes, and I already see uh, one hand here in the front row. Thank you so much, Larry, for this dark but very helpful talk. And uh, my question is that what chance do you see that the courts in the US uh, can accommodate some of the speed limit ideas that you presented? And among the speed limit suggestions, uh, how can we avoid the speed limit which would, uh, which would defend us from harmful content how can we avoid having that sort of speed limit regulation be abused? And I'm not saying it as a free speech extremist, which I'm not, just as someone who's concerned about, but I see the point why it's important, and you provided a very important example about Instagram. Thank you. 
So I think most American constitutionalists would say there's almost no chance that the Supreme Court will reverse itself and begin to protect the ability of governments to regulate algorithms. The, the only reason to be optimistic, if you believe this is something that should happen, comes from a weird political dynamic that the most conservative justice on the court, Justice Thomas, is introducing. Because what Justice Thomas is increasingly saying is, we should decide First Amendment cases, free speech cases, based on what the framers of the Constitution would have said. Okay, if that's true, then everything I've described is perfectly constitutional. Because there's no way that the framers of our Constitution had a conception of free speech that would have limited the government from regulating every aspect of the market for information, and that's all I'm talking about. But that's an outside chance. I think the only chance America has getting it right is if there are many other nations around the world who experiment with regulations, some of which work, and if we see regulations that work, we'll find a way to fit it back into our jurisprudence. So that's number one. Number two, with respect to harmful speech. I don't think that what I'm describing as speed limits can properly be applied to the subset of speech called harmful speech. You know, a speed limit like that would be like, say, stop every black car driving down the road, or stop every Audi driving down the road. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is every car can go maximum of 75 kilometers an hour. And the consequence of that, from Facebook's own data, is we will stop a significant portion of the misinformation that's being spread there. Um, that's not to silence anybody from uttering that speech. It's not to punish anybody for uttering that speech. It's to say you just don't get the automatic freedom of being able to distribute it to 40 million people by just pushing a button. If you want to distribute it to 40 million people, do it the way we had to do it in the old days. You know, send them an email um, or send them a text message. And if they don't want to hear your emails or text messages, that's your problem. It's not a problem of free speech. So I think that I would avoid saying categories like um, um, harmful speech can be regulated by speed limits. I think if it's a harmful speech regulation, then it's content-based, and I think we should avoid content-based regulations in this context. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions? Yes, I see one hand and two over there. Thank you. So I'm not a specialist of the First Amendment, and my question will attest to this. Uh, but it would be, what about the press clause? Uh, right, it's a great question. What about the press clause? And it's a great question, because I think it brings out the sense in which you can either think as independent of technology or controlled by technology. So when you think about the press, what certainly the press clause was imagining was an institution that engaged in publication by engaging in an editorial judgment about what content should be published and what content should not be published. It wasn't always neutral, indeed for most of the history of the press in the United States, press was very partisan, but still, even a partisan press tries to tell the difference between things which are true and things which are just fabrications or totally made up. So it's an institution for filtering which speech should be published. And it has an objective, sometimes to make money, sometimes to rally a political base, but that's what the press is. When you think about Twitter, you know, let's say Twitter circa 2015, that's not the press. I mean, it's similar to the press in the sense that I do a tweet, or if I'm Donald Trump, I do a tweet and I hit uh, tweet and 40 million people have it. So that's like publishing in the way the press publishes. But it has none of the essential features of the press, namely editors who are making judgments about what's true or good or valuable or not valuable. Instead, it's, a, it's kind of mainline into the conscience of humans. 
Um, and so I would not think that the press properly understood should automatically extend to anything that happens to replicate information, to, not in the replicant sense, but just copy information to the world. Um, now, in America, it turns out the f it, it, there should have been a jurisprudence for the press clause separate from the jurisprudence from the free speech clause. But early in the uh, court's history, it said, forget that, that's too complicated for us. We're only going to talk about free speech. So there's no special free press jurisprudence. But even if there were, my view is it shouldn't automatically attach to anything that happens to utter, to utter words. Thank you for the question. And we have two more uh, questions on this side. One at the far end of the room. Thank you very much for your talk, Professor. Uh, for me, it was um, kind of uh, astonishing that how much time we had to go down the road to fully understand what you, what you described, how the business model actually exploit the human weaknesses. Still, it stands to me that we, tried to, we need to accept that um, there is quite a small room to regulate if there is any. If I understand you correctly, we still do, we finally understood and we do hope that there are going to be kind of uh, regulations. So in this case, do you think that as a, as a last resort, competition law could be an answer for this kind of um, um, need for, for regulation in, 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 in protecting of human nature? Right. I, I would argue in favor of a more aggressive application of competition law regardless. It is striking. I mean, there was a nanosecond of my life when I was special master in the Microsoft antitrust case. It's astonishing that's the last time in the United States there was a prosecution against a technology company. And the idea that, for example, Facebook was allowed to swallow Instagram and swallow WhatsApp with no regulator saying there's any problem to this at all is astonishing. And we clearly should be deploying traditional antitrust law to avoid these companies becoming as powerful as they are, especially because their power translates into political power, and the political power translates into blocking any effort to effectively regulate them. So absolutely, I think antitrust law should be deployed more aggressively in this space. But I'm not sure it solves the problem I'm talking about. If you had 10 Facebooks, each of which was leveraging or exploiting the same weakness of us, would it be any better? I think it might be worse. Because one of the most striking documents in the Facebook files was um, Andrew Bosworth, who's one of the senior executives in Facebook, talking about the book I talked about, Salt, Sugar, Fat. And what Bosworth was implying by that was that even if Facebook came to understand that what it was doing was harming people, competitive conditions made it impossible for them to stop the harm. And right now, the only competition they face is like from TikTok, or maybe Snapchat, it's like not really ferocious competition. But if they were wildly, there was mildly greater competition, I think it might be harder for them to make a choice not to exploit the worst of us because that might be what they need to be able to competitively succeed. So I don't think it's enough to say break them up and the market will take care of this problem themselves. What we have to do is find a way for them to account for the poison or the effect of their poison. And right now, we don't have a useful way for the law to do that. Thank you, and I see two other questions here in the third row. Thank you very much, Professor. Also from a European constitutional law perspective, it was very interesting, the idea of the, the migration of constitutional ideas, if you want, from Europe to the United States. Uh, not only constitutional ideas, but also regulation ideas. Uh, I have uh, just one question. Um, it's also very interesting, uh, and I totally uh, agree, the idea that uh, the constitution should not be determined by technology, uh, but uh, uh, exactly not the way around. Now, 
in relation to your first great vision, intuition in 99 code, in which basically, uh, in a way, uh, there was the technology that, uh, I mean, uh, maybe it would not be, it was not uh, the hardcore, but for sure was at the constitutive powers. In a way, this, in a way, changed the idea in relation to the new threat and how. And then the last question, it's a clearly not provocative, but it's a provocative your thoughts in the reply to Easterbrook, the love of the horse and the love of the animals. It's possible that the Constitution could be the new love of the horse in this case. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, so you're right. E English has many different senses to the Constitution, and I certainly believe that technology is constitutive of um, the environment we live within. Um, but, the, but as you know, the argument of code is that we just can't take the constitutive environment uh, as if it's God-given. So um, if technology, I mean, you know, what I celebrated in that book was values which the technology seemed to be giving to us. You know, unintended, like the engineers when they built TCP IP didn't think about First Amendment or privacy, but they produced a technology which protected privacy, which protected free speech, and which protected the right to innovate. That was the consequence of that uh, in, uh, technology. And, and I would say that as in what that book said was, we should not assume that these values will protect themselves. And indeed, business and government both will want to take away free speech and privacy and the freedom to innovate. And we need to resist those changes by making sure the law protects the values that we want to be protected, whether directly or indirectly through code. And so I think it's a constant recognition of the, tr of the, the combination of the effect of technology and norms and the market and the law to produce the society we want. And we can't just assume it's going to take care of itself. Is the Constitution the new law of the horse? I mean, you know, the reality is... In America, the Constitution is so removed from popular sovereignty. It's a con accidental constraint driven so often by political interests rather than principles. And so I, I fear that in the United States, citizens feel removed from the Constitution in a profound way. And that leads to the increasing skepticism and dissonance within our popular culture from the law. So, um, so it might be as irrelevant as a law of the horse now. Um, uh, I don't think it needs to be, but I think that's, it's, that's the immediate future for that. Thank you also from my side. And as usual, listening to you, um, um, one gets provoked to ask something even more provocative. So forgive that I'm going to make three small points that will lead to a question which obviously is not very realistic. So let's for a moment not imagine whether tomorrow this can be turned into policy, but how you see it. If one looks at the description of what has happened, would not the example, instead of um, the, the way drug medication was changed, the regulation, would not maybe an even better example be nuclear power? Now, not meaning for warfare, but just for um, uh, peaceful use. Because it's not a damage to individuals, like with the drugs, but to society, what you've described. And because there's such a high risk with nuclear power, and that's why we regulate it very, very restrictively. Looking at the observing what you have rightly uh, said and made the point of, the damage is not just for the one or five or whatever amount of percentage of the population, but the society as such. If that's true, Second point, should we not even consider that if business models are out there that create damage to society, the ultimate choice might be we have to stop them. Now, I'm not suggesting, be careful, I'm not an extremist in the other direction to say social media platforms cannot exist because of the damage they do. But it's interesting that hardly ever anyone even dares to speak that out, although the damage very convincingly showed by you today as well, is potentially huge and potentially irreversible. And if we can see that coming, maybe we have to consider that something that was created in an unevil intention has become, it's gone loose and we have to stop it because we cannot get it back into the stables. And to make it at least a little bit more realistic, the last point, I understand your hesitation not to address harmful content, but to implement a measure which actually is not only convincing but seems to be 
possible to do relatively easily, the slowing down, right? But would that really be enough? Do we not also have to have, even under US constitutional terms, certain types of illegal content where we have to do more? We here in Europe are very obsessed at the moment that terrorist content, online terrorist propaganda is extremely dangerous, but let's take one where we agree with the US child pornography. So would be slowing down of sharing of child pornographic content be enough or do we not there need a full stop? And so if, if there would be a political environment where one could even suggest to implement your idea, which I find is great, slow down and that already you know, we get away of 90% of the problems, but for the rest, would we not also have to have a second um, solution? Thanks. Yeah, these are great. Um, with respect to the first nuclear power, I, I do think we're kind of in a Madame Curie moment. You know, so you remember Madame Curie does all sorts of fantastic research on radiation, radioactive materials, and then late into that research discovers the profound harm that this is causing to her, and of course, it was ultimately... Um, uh, the ultimate harm to her. I think that's kind of where we are with um, these technologies. Like we started using them, they had these magical properties. We were so excited, they glow in the dark and, and we can like paint um, you know, on child's cups, you know, names and things like that. And then, oh my God, we wake up and discover what they are doing to us. Um, and, and I think once we wake up and we discover just how significant the harm is, which of course the United States taught the world by dropping two atomic bombs, not on military targets, but on targets very closely related to populations, um, that we needed to intervene to um, regulate this in a full-scale way. I don't think we're quite to the place where most people would think this is like a nuclear bomb, but I, I don't know that I see it as much different, because that links to the second point. Um, um, I, so I can't read the note, but you said stop. And yeah, I said, if, if, business if a business model, model, model business is model, right. too damaging. Right. Um, I don't want to stop the, I, I don't want to stop the business, even though I, even if I do want to stop the business model. And what is the core of the business model? It is advertising driven content. Right now, that's a really accidental business model. Like we had the internet for many years without advertising driving the content. You know, think of AOL, I don't know if many people had AOL, AOL in the back. You know, they had lots of content, and AOL made lots of places where you could go and consume the content. You could read about politics, you could flirt with you know, somebody you've never met, you, know, you could do all sorts of things. But, it, but AOL, AOL was never focused on like feeding you what it knew would get you to spend more time on their platform. They charged you 20 bucks a month and that's all they cared about, getting their $20 a month. And that business model wouldn't be poisonous in the way that this business model is. So I do think that we should be asking, are there regulations of the business model that could avoid the worst? And here's one suggestion, which again, Europe could implement, but the United States could not. Imagine just banning um, advertising-driven content in the context of political or even hotly contested social issues, at least around an election. So a year before an election, you turn off advertising around this type of content. And, um, and the exception, like a French exception, would say, except for um, you know, registered political parties, they could do it. But this kind of unregulated, in the sense of outside of a campaign content, you just can't run ads on. You can still run ads on Nike or on Dunkin' Donuts. Okay, the market, like the commercial market, can still have this platform to try to drive commerce, but we would separate the commercial market and the rules for the commercial market in a kind of Waltzerian sense from the rules for the political market. I think that would be the kind of regulation I'd love to see tried, see what the effect of that would be. Um, uh, because uh, um, I think that, you know, this is the type of intervention that is feasible rather than the intervention of just, um, just blowing it up. I mean, it is important to realize, as you emphasize, this is the one example of a problem that weakens the capacity of government to solve the problem, right? I mean, if we don't fix social media today, Government's ability to fix it tomorrow is, is weakened. I mean, one of the striking examples in the Facebook files was European parties complaining to Facebook that Facebook's changed algorithm forced them to no longer share 
policy information about what their parties would do, but instead to become like Donald Trump, like spread hate and spread uh, uh, poison, because that was the only way their messages would be shared. So, you know, the idea that you've got an algorithm, which is just trying to make money, and oh, by the way, it's pretty successful at that. In the last five years, they've made $100 billion in profit. Okay, but just trying to make money, but forcing politics to go from relatively high-minded to as low-minded as it could be is, is astonishing, and, and I think should be a wake-up call. Um, um, uh, and then, yeah, is it enough to slow? I, I, so I am more in Peter's corner about the anxiety about content-based um, regulation than many, um, than maybe I should be. And I think we all agree there are some examples that we can intervene about. Child porn is one. You know, I fought many years against the extreme version of copyright, but copyright is another. Like, we have categories where we're okay blocking, absolutely. And, and maybe we should have a bigger conversation about what those categories should be, and, and I, I don't have problems with expanding them to you know, incitement to violence, especially on ethnic uh, bases. But I would much rather try the speed limit approach and see how far we get. Like minimal intervention into a free speech environment is the principle we should be embracing. And if it's not enough, then we have to take more. But I, but I, I mean, one of the most striking things about these papers is to read the, the kind of angst-ridden pleas of the engineers inside of Facebook. I mean, these engineers are like, these are the, the, the um, heroes of the story because they are trying to make the platform safer. They are trying to apply rules that make the platform safer. And they're constantly being interfered with by top-down politico types, you know, who Donald Trump is upset that we are kicking these people off because they repeatedly violate our rules, so we're going to bring those people back on. And they are screaming to the management, stop interfering, just let us do our job. And they're not allowed to do their job. Now, I don't know if they had done their job, whether that would have been enough to stop the craziness of January 6th. I mean, Tucker Carlson's a pretty powerful source of poison in our culture, and he was extraordinarily um, eager to spread that poison. And, you know, there's a huge outrage now because he's about to release a documentary telling the, quote, truth about January 6th, which is you know, truth in quotes about January 6th. Um, so I don't know if it would have been enough, but I would love to see um, whether it is. I mean, I think that's where we should start. Thank you for being such an active audience. Now, I think this is the last chance that you uh, can state your questions. So if anybody else has something to ask. Oh, two more uh, people. Uh, then we have one gentleman here in the fourth row. I'm also very grateful for this presentation. Just uh, one question. We've been talking about uh, regulative uh, measures or how law can be used, but um, what if the society does not want to be saved? What can be done there? Because uh, that's the basic thing, I think. Uh, and do you see any kind of development there? Uh, because that's, I think, a, a basic issue. Thank you. Yeah, so, so here, I think, the parallel to food is really compelling because you know, obviously the United States is a wildly unhealthy environment. Um, people are, um, you know, extremely poorly um, nutrition, uh, poor nutrition. But there's a movement, kind of bottom-up movement, called the slow food movement, which is kind of getting people to realize how the food they're being led to eat is poisonous to them. And that if they just cooked their own food and ate that would be enough to rect remedy much of the poison being spread. And so the point here is, it's like people taking responsibility for their own bodies. Now there's a parallel slow democracy movement that's trying to do the same thing with respect to the minds. It's like saying, turn off Facebook, turn off Twitter. Don't do politics in those contexts. Why? Because humans are just not any good at politics in those contexts. But if you do um, long-form journalism or podcasts or narrative um, 
There are lots of contexts in which humans can do politics very well. And so we should be shifting our focus into those contexts and away from these poisonous environments like cable television or, or uh, Facebook. Now, those movements are growing. There's an increasing recognition of the harm. I think the Facebook file, Francis Haugen's work is going to do a lot to spread recognition. But it won't because the vast majority are going to still eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. The vast majority are still going to get their stuff from Facebook. And when you say this is not what they want, you know, we all recognize the two wants inside of our body. Like there's the one that doesn't want to eat too much or drink too much. And then there's, there's the us that eat too much and drink too much. You know, that's just huge. Is it my fault? Okay, it's the antenna. It's my fault. Once again, my fault. Okay. <laughs> Once again, saved by the technologists. Uh, great. Um, uh, so I, I think it's important and we ought to encourage it, but I'm not sure that's going to be the solution. A couple of years ago, for a short period of time, you had earned international attention by announcing to be running for uh, president in the early days of the 2016 election campaign. And this has helped to focus public uh, attention on really important uh, public policy issues. If you were to decide to raise public awareness, for example, this way again, uh, what uh, policy issues would you flag up with in connection to this topic? you had in your lecture, and uh, I think there are some strong messages needed to penetrate the public ignorance regarding this issue. Right, so I tried to become a candidate in the Democratic primary in 2016, focused exclusively on the deep corruption that had rendered our government unable to govern. And, uh, um, you know, it was a kind of long shot idea. Um, but I would be, but the reason I made the decision to do it is that even if I was just in the debates, being able to focus attention on what we know everybody believes, the government is corrupted and it doesn't function to respect the public will, would have been reason enough to do it. And then when I qualified for the debates, or literally the week I was going to qualify, because polls were going to be released showing I should have been in the debates, they changed the rules of the debates to make sure that I wouldn't be in the debates. So um, it was a surprising and depressing reality, but the reality is that they were not eager. The Democratic Party was not eager for a crazy like Donald Trump to be in their primary. So I was not in the primary. Um, <laughs> Um, but if, but, but would I think there's a different issue in 2024? No. I think it's the same issue. Because all these things I'm talking about here, none of them will be addressed by our Congress, because our Congress is a deeply corrupted and broken institution. And it's corrupted and broken because members of Congress are dependent on a tiny fraction of America to fund their campaigns. Members of Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to fund their campaigns. 30 to 70% of the time sitting in an office calling people, begging for money. And, and of course, they're not dialing randomly. They're just not calling the average American. They're calling a tiny fraction of America who use that power to basically block any important change that the American Congress would make. That was a bad enough problem in 2015. It is an even worse problem today. Um, now, we were hopeful in this election because, you know, my group and a bunch of other groups had succeeded in getting every presidential candidate in the Democratic Party and two in the Republican Party to commit to reforms that were practically identical to what I was talking about four years ago, five years ago. Um, and voter suppression, and gerrymandering, and the corrupting influence of money in politics, those three together. And Joe Biden promised to uh, support it, um, and Nancy Pelosi, who runs the House of Representatives, championed it as her cause. 
and it passed the House twice and gets stalled in the Senate because of the filibuster. So um, I don't think it's going to pass in any substantial form out of the Senate. Um, but, you know, the thing you should recognize about the United States, all our pretense about being the greatest democracy in the world notwithstanding, <laughs> we are a minoritarian government. You know, like Iraq or Rwanda before, um, uh, you know, before the genocide. We're a minoritarian government in that um, the state legislatures, the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the President, all four of those institutions don't necessarily produce the winner as the winner. State legislatures are gerrymandered, so the Republican Party has many more seats than they're entitled to, given the votes. Uh, House of Representatives, the Supreme Court has said that there's no constitutional limit to partisan gerrymandering. So this next round, there'll be extreme gerrymandering. The Senate, you know, the idea that Wyoming, state with a population of 400,000, has as many senators as California, a state with a population of 53 million is just astonishing. Um, it's, not, it's not 50, I think it's 30 million, whatever. It's ridiculous, notwithstanding. And the presidency, because of the way we elect the president through the Electoral College, there are only basically six states that matter in the election. And those are the six states that the president cares about. So the point is, the majority doesn't win. And even more extreme, because of the rise of the filibuster in the Senate, the filibuster says that 60 votes are needed to pass any substantial legislation. And it used to be that was only in extreme cases, but now it's basically every law requires 60 votes. Well, just do the math. If it's 60 votes, that means 41 senators can block any law. 41 senators, so let's say we take the 21 states, the 21 smallest states, that supported Donald Trump by at least 10 points. Those 21 states would have 42 uh, votes in the Senate. Those 21 states would constitute 21% of the American public. So what that means is 21% of America gets to block whatever Congress wants to do. So we are in no sense a majoritarian democracy anymore. We have been walked into this world where a tiny minority, I mean, not tiny, but a minority controls what our government does. And that's worse today than it was four years ago or five years ago. And so still, I would say this is the fundamental issue. Like, we have to fix democracy first. If we're going to address this issue, a climate change or healthcare policy, or end the perpetual wars that the United States wages all across the world, you know, there's real talk in the United States of going, war, going to war with China. There are people who really think that makes sense. Uh, and that's a product of the same corruption. Um, and so that still, in my view, is the core problem. Thank you. Bernat, you wanted to ask something too. S sorry, both from you and from the audience, I will be way boring, way boring, boring with my question because it will be a follow-up on your uh, actual suggestions regarding platforms. Actually, I can see some of them, or most of them, working. I can imagine them working. Uh, out of all of your suggestions, the most striking to me, from a free speech perspective, is the flipped presumptions. You mentioned the situation with the minors, but could you tell us a little bit more about how it could work practically, this flipped presumptions model? Uh, or in what kind of situations beside minors, so how it could work in, 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 in practically speaking. So the difficulty we have, and I think everybody has, is we have no agencies that actually have the capacity to evaluate how algorithms function in the world. I mean, you know, people sometimes say Facebook is like a tobacco company in the sense that it's producing a product that it knows is causing harm. But the difference is, with tobacco, scientists had the ability to test the claims of the tobacco company because we could take people and test whether tobacco hurt them or not, and we had the data because the data was out there for all, all of us to see. 
nobody knows what's going on inside of Facebook except Facebook. And nobody can evaluate the harmfulness of their algorithms except Facebook itself. And what these files show is that they themselves knew of the harm and didn't take steps to address it. So the only way that such a flipped system would work is if you could imagine a regulatory institution that had the capacity to evaluate how algorithms were working. And, you know, obviously with the company, the company comes forward and says, here's the algorithm, and the agency would be allowed to run the test of the algorithm and see how, in fact, it works. So, for example, one of the tests that Facebook did itself of its newsfeed algorithm would create these, be to create these fake profiles. So they created a fake profile of a conservative 41-year-old woman from Iowa who liked Fox News and the Wall Street Journal. And then they could watch what the news feed fed that woman. And after a week, the news feed was feeding that woman conspiracy theories about Joe Biden stealing the election. And within two weeks, they were feeding her information about joining a militia. And the same thing happened on the left. They would feed, uh, it would have a woman who was a moderately liberal person who within two weeks was driven into some crazy left-wing conspiracy theories. So the point is they have a method for seeing what their algorithms are doing. And if you had a regulator who could run the same tests and say, okay, if you're a 13-year-old girl who's gonna use this platform um, to see images, what kind of images are you gonna be driven if you happen to talk about you know, body dysphoria image, uh, problems. Will you be fed body dysphoric images? Will you be led to believe you're a lesser person because of these images? Like, we could do the same tests that they do, and then when they claim that this is safe, we can say, well, let's see whether it's safe. Just like a drug manufacturer says, we believe this drug is safe and effective, and here's the data to support it, we could imagine them doing the same thing. Now, there are only, to build on you know, the concern that I think Peter was having and the point that you were raising, I think there are only certain contexts where in the United States that would be legitimate. Like you couldn't do that for the general public and political speech, even if we should, but you just couldn't. But with, child, with children, we have a strong regulatory presumption in favor of protecting children or the vulnerable, and I think it's not implausible to think of building institutions that can actually do that.